Welcome to my talk about Gibbs non Gibbs transitions for Widom Rowlands and models on trees. My name is Sebastian Bergmann, and this has been a joint work with Sascha Kissel and Christoph Kulske, and we were wondering whether Gibbsian measures of this model stay Gibbs under influence of a stochastic time evolution. We start with a KD tree of order d, that is an infinite regular tree where each vertex has a d plus 1 neighbors. Here is the case d equals 3 depicted, where each vertex has uh, exactly 4 neighbors. And uh, each of these vertices can take one of three values. It can be occupied by a plus or minus spin, or it can be empty, indicated by a zero spin. And now we have the widom rowlandson potential, which gives us a so-called specification. This is a family of probability kernels, and you can think of them as conditional probabilities. The conditional probability to find a specific configuration in the region lambda, uh, if we fix the exterior spins, is given by the exponential of the sum of all these interactions in lambda or between lambda and the exterior. And there are two types. We have a um, repulsion parameter beta, and um, this governs repulsion between plus and minus spins. If beta is large, uh, adjacent plus and minus spins become less likely. And we have a particle activity lambda, and with growing particle activity lambda, occupied spins, that is occupied by plus and minus, become more likely, and uh, these uh, empty sides become less likely. And now we search for so-called Gibbs measures of this model. These are measures whose conditional probabilities coincide with uh, these kernels, so with these local interactions. And we know that for all beta and all lambda, there exists a unique spin-flip invariant and homogeneous Gibbs measure, which we call an uh, intermediate measure for the widom rowlands model. And we take this measure and examine um, it's under influence of a spin-flip time evolution. And this uh, time evolution acts independently on all sides, and um, the empty uh, spins, they stay empty, and the plus and minus spins, they get flipped with a constant rate. So the probability of finding a flipped spin uh, grows with time. And now we were wondering whether the time-evolved measure is still a Gibbs measure. And in particular, we want to show uh, or search for parameter regimes um, where the measure is non-Gibbs. And a uh, condition for non gibbsianness are so-called bad configurations. So these bad configurations are configurations that allow for long-range interactions. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at single-side probabilities conditioned on um, these uh, configuration eta, um, in a finite region, in a finite ring around this uh, spin. And then we take uh, different configurations outside of this and uh, look um, at the difference uh, of the, the probability in the center. And if there is a difference, we call this configuration uh, a bad configuration because then uh, it's possible that these far away influences under growing lambda uh, percolate through this configuration eta. And um, Gibbs measures uh, have the property um, to be um, consistent with a specification, and these specifications don't exhibit this behavior. They are in some sense, uh, they are what's called quasi-local, which is uh, uh, some in some sense uh, short range and um, this contradict, uh, these bad configuration contradict this property. So we need to find them and our main result is that for the Cayley tree of order d greater than 4 or equal 4, there exists a d-dependent constants beta and lambda critical, um, which are larger than 0 but finite, such that for all parameters beta and lambda which are larger, the uh, measure becomes non-Gibbs after some time t, which depends on beta and d. And not only this, but the set of bad configurations actually has full measure. So um, one single bad configuration would suffice to show the measure, the time-evolved measure is non-Gibbs, but we actually have a, a set of full measure of bad configurations. 
And the proof of this has uh, three distinct steps. The first step is to show that if a configuration contains a suitably large occupied uh, subtree of order d plus one half, so occupied by plus and minus spins, um, it is a bad configuration for large beta and uh, large times t. And then we show that uh, these occupied subtrees become typical. This is done using a standard uh, golden watson tree argument. So uh, then we know that the set of bad configurations has positive probability. And in a last step, we prove a 0-1 law for bad configurations, um, which uh, leads to a full measure badness for the uh, specific parameters. And I would like to uh, spend the remainder of my talk talking about this uh, first point. So how do we prove this in concept? Um, we represent these conditional probabilities that are used for the badness criterion by what's called boundary fields. And um, if you look at this representation, the important thing is that uh, the only part that depends on far away spins uh, on the outside are these boundary fields. So uh, to show the badness criterion, it is sufficient to show that these boundary fields um, at the center vertex uh, are different for different configurations. And um, these boundary fields are calculated by recursion. It starts at zero and then, then it depends on the specific configurations. Um, the important thing to note for this um, recursion is that uh, uh, subsequent boundary fields uh, only depend on uh, the boundary fields that that basically go over edges uh, with occupied spins. And uh, also the spins influences recursion by a magnetic field term which is t dependent but um, this uh, actually uh, goes to zero. It stays positive but goes to zero for large times. And um, I would like to show you some pictures how this recursion works. So we have uh, plus and minus boundary conditions with the uh, corresponding fields. And then we take configurations eta in the center, uh, which are identical in this case, uh, just empty. And in uh, this empty case, we see there's there are no, no percolating boundary fields. So this configuration is actually good. But now if we um, take a subtree indicated by these arrows, and occupy the spins along the subtree, we uh, have a percolating boundary field. So these uh, boundary fields actually reach the center. They stay positive. Here they stay negative. And this uh, happens for growing lambda. So uh, regardless of the size of lambda, uh, as soon as s is greater than 2, so if we have a occupied subtree uh, of order 2 or larger. And um, but now, um, we might uh, get uh, non-empty spins outside of this tree um, and they might uh, destroy this uh, percolating boundary field recursion. And um, here you can see uh, these uh, appendages uh, basically develop their own negative boundary field values um, because they are not connected to the outside. and um, they have a negative influence on this um, recursion that was uh, positive beforehand. And uh, if lambda grows large, actually there's no difference in boundary fields uh, in the center. So this would be a good configuration. But uh, if we now uh, calculate this rigorously and um, apply our stricter condition um, we've mentioned before, um, of uh, and have a larger occupied subtree, um, these uh, appendages, these negative influences of the appendage can um, be cancelled out by more positive influences that are percolating from the outside. So uh, these configurations are good even for growing lambda because the recursions have positive or negative fixed points. And um, this is basically the idea of the first step. And uh, this is all I wanted to show you. Here are the references, the paper itself, a similar paper for the easing model, which we drew uh, inspiration from, um, a good introduction to the uh, concept of non gibsonness and Gibbs measures in general, and the existent result for uh, the intermediate measure. 
Thank you for your attention.